Welcome to In the House. My name is Mark Shiver. So glad to have you watching, listening to episode number nine. And uh, the show is really taken off and getting some real positive response. And so thank you for that. Today, I'm very excited. Our guest is Representative Keith Kidwell, representing District 79 down in Beaufort and Craven counties. Representative Kidwell, welcome. Good morning, Mark. Thank you very much for doing this and a pleasure to be with you. Now, um, the short session has just ended. I know you're glad about that. Um, typically, when we've had these short sessions, you know, the, the ideal has been we're going to get out by July 4th and then they're here to September and you guys just can't seem to get the budget done. And Speaker Moore this time said, we're leaving. We're done July 4th. And lo and behold, y'all were done. How would you feel about that? It's a good feeling, right? Well, it was a new feeling. This is, this is my uh, fourth year in the house. It's the first time we actually got out anywhere near the scheduled time. So I was very excited about that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was looking, uh, I get this email every day about this day in history. And they said that today in 1969, Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. And I was wondering, uh, I'm kind of an old guy, but I remember where I was. Do you remember where you were when uh, you saw Neil Armstrong? Did you see him walk on the moon? I did, actually. Uh, my, my parents made sure of that. And interestingly enough, Mark, my, my grandfather, who we call Papa, he was uh, he was an older man at the time. He was born 1902. So wow. when man first took flight, it was the same year he was born. And then when he watched them walk on the moon, uh, I remember... Papa actually sat there and cried uh, for the the accomplishments that man had done to go from 12 feet of flight to flying to the moon. It's it's amazing. It had to be just something to really behold in, yeah. in your lifetime. No doubt. That's amazing. I was, uh, we were camping. My parents and me and my sister used to go camping and a guy at the campground had a television set up. So we're well, all gathered around watching, you know, and that was exciting. I'll never forget that. So um, I like to ask the guests on in the house, you uh, serving in the house of representatives. Serving really means a lot. It has to. And one of the ways you serve is helping out your constituents. I've been here for quite a while and I know the phone rings a lot. You guys, people need help with various issues. But before we started recording, you were telling me an interesting story about how you helped one of your constituents with uh, Mino Insurance Company. <laughs> Why don't you share that uh, with us? Yeah, that, that was an interesting case. Young boy named Wade. Uh, I had put a post on Facebook that, that had to do with some aggravation that he had experienced with an insurance company and getting a medication uh, approved that my wife had been on for 10 years. And all of a sudden they decided she needed pre-approval. And when I put that post on Facebook, uh, somebody contacted me back and said, Representative, uh, you have this young child in the area that the insurance company won't approve his medication. And it, it's life threatening. Wow. So I contacted the parents and found out that, that this young man, 18 months old, had a condition. I don't remember what it was, but if he was not treated uh, with the medication and treatment he needed, uh, he would have at the very least wound up in a wheelchair the rest of his life and or dies. Good, good. And so I sat down and interviewed the parents and, and looked at the records and called the insurance company and asked them to come to my conference room uh, that next Monday at 10 a.m. I, I did a little more than ask. I kind of insisted that they be there. Uh, and when they showed up, we went through what was going on and some other issues. And I, I literally took the boy's file and threw it on the table in front of them and told them, this is why America hates insurance companies because you're willing to kill people for profit. Oh my goodness. And of course they started telling me how you know poor they were and they were broke. And I said, look, don't, don't sit here and try and kid me. I know that you just gave your, your president a $13 million bonus. And every town I go into, you have the largest buildings in that town uh, next to maybe a bank. It's going to be the largest buildings. And I said, it's the, you know, you're, you're just not doing the right thing here. I said, now I've, I've only been here a short time. But I got a pretty good idea that the 79th district is going to keep sending me back. So we're going to resolve this issue and you can work with me or not. It's your choice. Uh, but we will resolve this. And I, I kind of laid it on the line to them. Wow. The next morning, they had a meeting 
emergency meeting over boy, over that boy's treatment, and it was approved by noon the next day. Great. Now, here's the interesting part, Mark. That boy is now about four years old, oh, and good. he is walking and talking and doing things that four-year-olds are supposed to do and now has little twin siblings that, that were oh. born in about the last year. So, you know, life is back to normal for him. Uh, for the insurance company, not so much because yeah. we're still going to take those battles on. Yeah. Well, you know what? It's it's good that someone like yourself, a representative of the people, is there and willing to help. But it sure is a shame that you got to do that. You know what I mean? It is. Yeah. And, and interestingly enough, just a couple of points. I never asked them what party they were in. And they're not even in my district, that family. Wow. They, they literally don't live in my district. But it was somebody that needed help, and I was going to make sure they got it. You know, that's that's interesting that you say that. Several other uh, guests that we've had, members of the House, have said the, the same thing. It, it helped people that were not in their district. So I guess this, and I didn't mean to go in this direction, but I guess this concept of helping others and serving it's really what drives you to be an elected official. I, I, it's a challenge. It, I can't say it's always enjoyable, but it's rewarding. Uh, sometimes you have to get downright mean or nasty. I've had people call me a bully, and if that's what it takes, uh, I, I'm going to fight for the people. That's why they sent me to Raleigh. I, I've said this to many of folk because I get a lot of people that, you know, representative, we, we appreciate what you do. And I told him, I said, I'm in Raleigh doing what you sent me to do. Uh, you may not be used to that with a lot of elected people, but get used to it because I'm going to continue to do it. Yeah. Well, good for you. And I know your uh, people you represent appreciate that. Now, um, I was looking at some of the bills that were passed over the last session. One of them has your name on it, uh, the Jeff Reed bill, uh, which was, uh, which I think I... You know, I'm an ordained minister, so I particularly think this is a tremendous piece of legislation. Can you explain that, Bill, uh, to those who are watching? Well, that, that comes on the heels, Mark, of the, the governor's overreach, and we'll probably talk more about that. Uh, I had just finished a battle, a court battle, with the governor uh, when he closed our churches down, when COVID started. And I, I sat here in my house and started yelling at the television again, which I hadn't done since I got elected because it, it, it generally doesn't help. But, and I just said, you don't have the authority to do that. So I, I ended up getting 820 churches together, raised a bunch of money. And in less than two weeks, I had a lawsuit filed and we got a uh, determination by the federal courts that the governor did not, in fact, have the authority to close the churches. And just a little bit after that, I find out that hospitals are not allowing families to go in and visit people, most particularly uh, when they're at end of life. And the one gentleman that the bill is named after, Jeff Reed, his, his family got in touch with me uh, in regard to being able to go in and, and visit with Jeff, who had been hit by a car while standing in his yard, knocked to his feet, went to the hospital, was or knocked off his feet, went to the hospital, and they sent him home. <laughs> what they didn't realize is Jeff was on a blood thinner and had gotten a brain bleed. Oh, okay. And the next morning when his wife woke up, Jeff was not well at all. Mm. They, they took him back to the hospital. Uh, long story short, he ended up uh, what they referred to as brain dead, I think. I don't think that's the medical term. but uh, And they would not allow the pastor nor the family to go in and visit Jeff and, and whatever prayers. And in my faith, it's called last rites and uh, that type of thing. They, they wouldn't let it happen. Well, that just infuriated me. I got on the phone with the hospital. I went up one side of them down the other, and I said, we're going to stop this. And I did finally get the hospital to agree. Uh, matter of fact, I spoke to the president of the hospital, and he told me that because of my spending literally eight hours on the phone, Mark, uh, with every member of the General Assembly that I could get on the phone on that day and had them call the hospital and insist that uh -huh. they allow these people in. Well, he finally called up and said, please stop. We're going to set up a bereavement room. This is during COVID. We're going to set up a bereavement room that will allow up to 10 family members to come in. And I, I was like, why didn't you just do this to start with? Yeah. I mean, let, let's face reality, Mark. What was going to happen if people went into this patient's room? He was already deceased. 
let, let you know let's call it the way it is yeah. what, what was going to happen any worse than that yeah. to this patient okay yeah. you know they have mobile units they could have set up outside i don't care if they went and ran an rv you know yeah. it, it shouldn't matter make whatever accommodation you need to so the the bill that we passed the jeffrey bill forbids hospitals from not allowing clergy of any faith into a hospital to visit a patient even during a pandemic that well, they cannot yeah. do it and i've had report after report where people have literally taken that piece of legislation and had to show it to staff members at the hospital and say you can't do this hmm. okay uh, one of my sheriffs in fact I, I contacted him because the hospital repeatedly kept doing this in in craven county and I called the sheriff down there. I said, Chip, here's the legislation. What say you? He said, well, representative in the future, if anybody has this problem in my hospitals, you call me personally and I will escort them into the room. Oh, wow. Okay. Good. So, you know, um, on the surface, a lot of people might not think that that is significant, but I've been in the hospital a couple of times, not very many, thankfully, but it's lonely up in there. It is. And if you're uh, someone who is a person of faith and you really want to see your pastor and really want to be prayed for and they won't allow that, yep. that's that's terrible. I mean, and so I personally appreciate you working to get this legislation passed. And I know there are probably myriad people, uh, innumerable amount of people who are thankful for this legislation. Hopefully. We won't have, you know, ongoing pandemic situations uh, in the future, but it's good to know that this bill is out there and has been signed into law. I was glad to do it, Jeff. Uh, uh, Mark, it's just a shame that we had to do it. I, yeah. I, yeah, when I look at the Constitution of, of both the United States and North Carolina, it forbids infringement on your religion and the practice of it. And certainly, uh, when you think about it, when people are in the hospital, it's a time that they need clergy more so than any other time in their life yeah uh and and that can be any doctor will tell you that that, that the presence of clergy and family goes a long way toward helping people to heal yeah absolutely so um we talked about the the short session and just uh wound down uh july 4th and um the budget got tweaked a little bit and over the course of the long session and the short session, uh, there was uh, money from federal COVID funds. There was more revenue than than uh, you guys anticipated because of the uh, way that you handle the state's finances. The tax cuts seem to be generating more revenue and we could go into all that. But uh, some of the members were able to get some infrastructure things for their districts. And I was uh, looking on the internet and there's a big uh, news article and I'm going to probably butcher the pronunciation here, but the town of Chaco Did I say it right? You nailed it. Good. Uh, <laughs> you got them an ambulance. It says big article says representative Keith Kidwell uh, gets the town an ambulance. So I mean, that's got to make you feel good, right? Yeah. It, well, you know, let, let's, Set the record straight. I, I submitted the legislation to make it happen. People bought their own ambulance. Uh, it came from tax money. Yeah. And uh, you know what? What I was able to do was to to look at the budget and find where we could come up with that appropriation to to get the money into into the Chocolatey ambulance system. Here, uh, there were other items we were able to get money toward, not totally pay for, but towards some fire trucks. Uh, one in Bunt Creek and the other down in Pantigo area. Uh, We've had so many good things that, that we were able to do here. You know, we got $20 million that will go towards our airport, Washington Warren Field. That's wow. going to allow for expansion and building new hangars. That's going to be a huge economic engine oh, for yeah. Eastern North Carolina. Uh, I'm working currently with, uh, with the drone industry, representatives from the drone industry, to see if we can bring that uh, industry into Warren Field in Eastern North Carolina. Uh, we got $2.5 million, $2 million for a college annex uh, to be built down near our largest employer uh, that they are going to need for re-educating their staff and being our largest employer. If we can help them, we will. But it also helps the town of Aurora 
as soon as the uh, the announcement was made that we would be building a college annex down there, the town that was dying ended up getting phone calls from restaurant people who want to build there now because there's a college coming, a motel. Uh, a person wants to build a hunting lodge. I was able to get that employer to allocate two lots of land, one for 80 new affordable homes to be built upon wow. uh, to house people in that area, as well as an industrial park. And that industrial park is already seeing activity where we have two businesses that want to headquarter in there. And, and we're seeing a, uh, a bunch of growth coming up in Aurora. So from one end of the district to the other, uh, we've been able to bring funding in. But what I've tried to do with that, Mark, is to make sure that that money is targeted towards jobs, economic growth, and or taxpayer relief and things like fire trucks and ambulances. Yeah, yeah. You know, it struck me here, uh, thought I'd just mention this, that uh, probably when a person decides to run for office, they might have these grand aspirations that, you know, we're going to protect the Second Amendment and we're going to uh, fight for freedom and democracy and, and all of that. But it sounds like a lot of your time is spent on the phone and just making calls and trying to make stuff happen for your, yep. for your district. And uh, which leads me to, as you said, it's supposed to be a part time legislature, but it sounds like it takes about more of, the, more of your time than, than part time, doesn't it? It does. I, I, you know, to try and put it into the number of hours per week, I, I couldn't even venture to guess, but yeah. it, it's, it's far more than even a 40 hour week on the average week, to be honest with you. And it's really, it requires the support of your family. Yeah. You know, if, if you don't have your family support, don't get into this business because it's not going to end well, either at the family end or the political end, you're going to have to end up making a choice. Uh, yeah. So, you know, you, you got to try and balance that. And that can be difficult at times. Um. I want to get your thoughts. The News and Observer today actually has a rather lengthy piece on the budget. And it says with inflation soaring, uh, legislators opt to save money instead of spending it. And it's not really a negative uh, connotation there, but it speaks to the way that for the last 10 years, 11 years since the uh, the General Assembly has been under a Republican majority. This uh, prudent, I call it prudent management of our taxpayer funds. And uh, an example, a couple of, well, maybe six weeks ago now, there was a big thing that, oh, there's going to be, you know, lots and lots more revenue than anticipated. And immediately, you know, in the media, folks on the left were like, wow, oh, let's spend, spend, spend. But you guys have a much more uh, thoughtful, cautious approach. Is, is that something you ascribe to when you came into the legislature? Were you down with that whole notion of the way the finances have been handled in our state? I think there, there's been some excellent work done since the 2011 when, when Republicans took control. Mark, if you go back and look at where we stood then, uh, we owed the the federal government billions of dollars in unemployment tax money. Uh, we were raising taxes. We were raising sales taxes. We were spending like drunken sailors. And now we're in a situation where we have a surplus. We have cut taxes. I, I think it's eight times now. You know, people ask me sometimes when they don't understand, they'll say, Representative, when are we going to see some of our money back? I said, well, you're not going to see it back because what we did is rather than taking your money, we're leaving it in your pocket so we don't have to send it back to you. Yeah. Okay. And that, in fact, is what happened. I am in the tax business, so I've seen the impacts of it. Our tax rate went from a top rate of 7.75% to we're now down to 4.9 and falling. Wow. Wow. That is scheduled to be cut over the next several years. So we've dropped taxes significantly in North Carolina. At the same time, We've been able to generate and put money in reserve. When the hurricanes have hit us in, in the past, we didn't have money. We had to put our hand out to the Fed. That usually takes a year to two years to get the money. We now have money in the bank, in reserve accounts, waiting for that next hurricane. Uh, in this current budget, we set aside funding for the impending, and it's impending, economic failure that we're going to see in the United States over the next several years. 
There's absolutely no doubt about it. It's going to happen. We see it today with prices of gas near $5 a gallon. Diesel fuel near $6 a gallon. That is going to impact the people. And we in North Carolina will be in a great position for that. If I'm not mistaken, we've recently been ranked number one in business friendliness. And we're the number one economic engine as a state in North Carolina. That's right. Absolutely. So um, I want to just say one thing about that. You know, uh, one of the things that that you guys have done is uh, raise the standard deduction. And two thirds of the people that file taxes in our state, they use the standard deduction because they don't have enough deductions to itemize. Those aren't the top 1%. Well, those are people like me, you know, middle class working every day. And so when the media comes out and the left complains, all oh, their tax cuts for the rich, I just laugh and say, that's just dumb. And it's not true yeah. because uh, people taking that standard deduction, they're not in the 1% and they're not, quote, the rich. So I appreciate as a citizen, all that you guys are doing to help people like me. Yep. You know? I, I get it. Yeah, the wealthier are pretty much the ones that itemize their tax deductions because they're they're spending the monies that allow for those itemized deductions. Uh, it's typically people that are in the lower income brackets that use the standard deduction, and we've not gotten that to a point that it's it's gotten to where it takes care of most of the average citizen that they're not even going to pay tax in the state of North Carolina. I, I say average. I'm talking middle income and below. Yeah. You know, the wealthy folks, you know, go ahead and pay the taxes. You know, it, it's one of the uh, the necessary evils in life, as as you'll recall, Ben Franklin said, the, the two short things in life are death and taxes. Yeah, exactly. Um, as we wind up, I try to keep this around 20 minutes where we're, we're getting there now. But I did want to ask you, you're very involved with the Freedom Caucus, which yes. is a caucus within the North Carolina House. Uh, briefly, tell us uh, what that is and some of your goals and uh, and uh, what is the Freedom Caucus? So the Freedom Caucus is any member of the North Carolina House uh, who is like-minded to the subjects of freedom. And what we what we represent is smaller government, less spending, and liberty. That that is what we try to do is to make sure that any legislation that is passed through the General Assembly meets that criteria. Uh, We're about 27 members strong at this point. Wow. Uh, We have had great impact in getting bad bills fixed. Uh, We've actually had several bills that we have killed even on the floor of the House. Uh, One that came up that that was killed before it actually got to the floor that was literally on the calendar for that day. And when I went to leadership and said, uh, guys, the Freedom Caucus will stand firmly against this bill when it hits the floor, it was pulled. And that bill has not come back. And that was internet voting. Okay. Uh, There's been several uh, pieces of legislation, uh, cameras up and down the highways that read license plates, and, and they would track and keep that data. Uh, we feel that's an infringement on your uh, Fourth Amendment right to privacy. There's, there's no need for the government to track the motion of every car on the highway. State troopers, cars, and sheriffs, and, and most police departments now have license plate readers mounted on their cars. Yeah. Uh, why do we need them on the highway? Why does our government want the ability to track us. And of course, they'll tell you how mundane and secure it is because it won't be mistreated or misused. Uh, so you're telling me trust the government. <laughs> um, no, yeah. no, I, I don't trust. And I'm part of it. And no, I don't trust. it. Yeah. OK, so that, that's what the Freedom Caucus does. We've, we've just begun this uh, this last few months going across the state doing rallies uh, to to rally people to the, the cause of freedom. I mean, that's really what this is. It's a lot of good, strong, conservative members. And, and Mark, I'm looking forward to uh, increasing those numbers in November uh, when we bring in more conservative, freedom-minded people and, and have them join the ranks of the caucus. I'm hopeful we'll get up in the neighborhood of 35 to 40 members at that time. Uh, well, um, this has been fascinating. And uh, I hate that we run out of time. Everybody I talk to, I, I just really enjoy it. So uh, we'll in, I will invite you for another session and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about some national issues uh, that are pressing into our country and into our lives and certainly trying to impinge upon our freedom. And uh, I would look forward to that if you'd, uh, if you'd come back in the next couple of months or so. But Representative Keith Kidwell, 
thank you very much for being our guest today on In the House. Mark, thank you for your time. Appreciate you doing this. Have a great day. You too.